Okay, so welcome to episode 3 in the Fracture Modifier Learning Series. And this time we are going to talk about constraints. So Scorpion81 and me had some chats to prepare some explaining graphics for you and to talk about how to explain constraints in a way you might understand best. We are not going to explain each little detail here as there are some most interesting settings that will be enough to understand to make great simulations. Alright, like with every tutorial video I recommend you to visit blenderphysics.com to download the latest custom build and to make sure we are working with exactly the same version. Let me start with a simple prepared scene. Here is a wall with 100 pieces and a cylinder that hits it from behind. And the wall has animated and triggered enables to avoid that pieces uh, to fall down without being touched, while the cylinder is a trigger uh, to enable touched pieces to fall. And when playing the animation you can see how well that works. Okay, and now I enable constraints for the wall. And I play the animation and some strange things is happening here. The pieces return back to the hot position, but why? Okay, time for our explain graphics. What you see here is a prefectured wall with some red dots and lines. And each red dot represents the centroid of a shard and every red line represents a uh, constraint. We are showing only a few of that connections to make it easier to explain what's going on here. A blender, you are not able to make these constraints visible, but as you have seen in this tutorial, you know they still are there when enabled. <laughs> okay, so uh, back to blender. Now you understand why all these pieces are returning back to their start position. The invisible constraints are pulling them back. And that means the last thing to do is tell the constraints to break on a specific point to not pull the pieces back. And that's so easy. Choose a value for percentage, angle or distance or a combination of all three and you're done. So let me show you an angle of 2 degrees. This means when shards rotate more than 2 degrees its constraint will break and release it. And that would mean using a higher value like an example 45 degrees will only break constraints from shards that rotate more than 45 degrees. And yes, exact this is happening here. And the same way distance or percentage will work. But what's that search radius for? Hmm. Let's have a look to our graphic. The search radius defines uh, the area where pieces will be connected by constraints. Only pieces where, con uh, where centroids are completely surrounded by the search radius will get constraints. And the search radius starts from each centroid with covering Nibor centroids. Just for demonstration, in our graphics the brighter blue pieces represent who gets constraints, because the search radius covers the centroids. Keep in your mind that the search radius will start from every shard centroid. We do only show one of these here. The search limit limits the number of constraints per shard. In our graphic you see six red lines, as we told the fraction modifier, to not build more than six constraints per shard. If we would type in a lower value, one neighbor shards would not get a connection from this shard. Overall, we can say the less constraints we have, the more unstable the wall will be, and the more constraints we have, the more stable the wall will be. But this will also have an effect on the simulation speed. The standard values are okay. Um, the threshold defines how high the impact energy from a colliding object must be to break constraints. Understand this as a kind of sensitivity for impacting objects. Thresholds does uh, also only make sense on simulated objects. In our example, we are using a keyframed object. The threshold value will not have any effect here. We will look at this later. Okay, step by step. To demonstrate all this in our scene, let me disable triggering and start with a search radius of 1. 
As you can see, the whole wall falls down. And using a low surge radius like 0 0.5 makes the wall become more unstable, as less shards are covered by constraints. Play around with surge radius to find a setting that matches your idea of a simulation. You understand? The more possible settings we show you, the more complicated everything seems to become. But don't worry, in the most simulations, the search radius at an angle will be the most interesting settings. By the way, you can switch to another search method called vertex. See our graphic. In general, this will work exactly like the method before, but with a difference. The search radius does not surround the pieces centroids, but their vertex. While this will have an effect on your simulation result, you should also take notice of the required smaller search radius, because there are much more vertex on one piece and each vertex will look for neighbors depending on the search radius value. Compared to only one century to work with using the centric method, the simulation will be a lot slower when using higher radius values. So let's check this. While setting the search method to vertex, the radius to 1 and a breaking angle of 0 0.5, the simulation will be a bit slower. On more complex models, you will see a bigger performance drop. Try 0 0.1 and you see the wall breaks. But when switching back to the century search method, the wall is completely instable. So this is what the explain so this is what we explain in the graphic. The vertex search method connects pieces with a lower search radius as vertex that are surrounded by the search radius will be connected. While the centroid search method needs centroids to be surrounded by the search radius and that's why it must be bigger. Okay, good. You're saying, wow, a lot of information, a lot to play around with. But did you know that there are other constraints too? It's simple. We talked about connections between shards, but what if there would be a way to collect multiple shards into something like a container? And what if we could decide from how many containers our wall is made of? And what if we could connect these with constraints and use their own rules to break them? Yes, I'm talking about clusters. And we are only a few clicks away from making this real. Back to our graphic. Mm, so here you can see what happens when typing in a value for clusters. An example, a value of 3 means to have 3 containers containing some shards. The green area is one cluster or one container, the red one is one cluster and the yellow one two. These clusters are generated randomly, there's no way to affect what shards will be chosen to become a cluster. So as soon as you type a value into the cluster count field, clusters will be generated and also automatically generated other clusters constraints. Let's call the clusters constraints interconnections, do not confuse them with the regular constraints. And we show these interconnections as blue lines here to different them. But they work like all the other constraints and you have uh, own breaking rules for them. You can set them in the right fields. Sounds too simple to be true, okay? So let's take a look to our blender wall. Make sure triggering still is disabled. I'll set the search method to centroid and one and I choose to have three clusters. And I disable all rules from the constraints by setting them to zero. Instead, I will set rules for my clusters. A cluster angle of 0.01 could be a good start, as I would like to break the interconnections as fast as possible. I now play the animation and you can see three clusters. Changing the cluster's angle back to zero means nothing will break, so let's stay on 0.01. But did you believe it would be that easy? Do you need more clusters? Type in a higher value. Let's try 8. Play the animation and you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is so fantastic. 
would you like to see single shots to break away too? So it's easy. Set the general constraints angle to 0 0.3. Play the animation. Great. Setting a lower angle for the clusters makes sense, as we want the clusters to break before single shots. But play around with this and find your settings. Uh, what if I would like to use uh, triggering also? So enable animated and triggered and play the animation. And now it seems that my setting doesn't have any effect. That's because triggering limits the simulation to only the triggered elements of your scene. We can expand the affected area by using the activate broken feature. And this is a very great feature. Activate Broken will make the simulator to watch out for neighbors' clusters and shards while being in the triggered mode. Of course, this will change the way your simulation is looking like without triggering. Let's decrease the cluster count to 1 and you will see the whole wall will be affected while using triggering. I think Activate Broken is a very useful feature and helps a lot to get more realistic simulations as the affected area can be big. If you would ask me what kind of setting would be the right for you, I would answer it depends on your scene. On bigger and more complex scenes I would recommend to use triggering and activate broken as this simulates faster. But on less complex scenes working without triggering will be a bit easier as you have a better control about how the simulation will look like. Of course that all depends on your used hardware, your scene and what you think a good simulation should look like. Yeah, before we go on with the last great topic in this tutorial, let me show you how thresholds affect your simulation. I'll disable triggering and activate broken and set all angles to zero to disable all the breaking rules. As I told you, Thresholds defines the required energy from a colliding object to break our fractured object. And this energy, and as this energy is required to be part of the simulation, a keyframed object like my cylinder here will not do anything. So let's make the cylinder become a ghost object. What makes it flying through the wall? And let me also hide it from the viewport. Let's add a falling cube with a mass of 3 for harder impact to our scene and place it here mm -hmm. and make it an active rigid body. So this is what our simul simulation looks like. Nothing breaks. Let's say we would need less energy from this falling cube to break the wall. That would mean to use a lower value for threshold. So type in 0.1 and as you can see, the wall breaks more like before. Set it back to 10 and enable clustering by setting a cluster count of, in example, 3. And before I go on here, here's something confusing I have to tell you. Let's go to the graphic. I've spoken to Scorpion81 and he told me that thresholds work different when using with clusters. So this graphic shows our actual settings. As you can see, the connection lines between single shards became yellow here to demonstrate that they will be controlled using the cluster breaking threshold. And you can see that violet parts here. Violet shows the interconnections between the clusters. You see, the regular thresholds value field controls the clusters and the cluster breaking threshold field controls the single shards inside the clusters. It's completely the other way around as working with clusters, uh, without clusters. So let's go on. Play the animation. Nothing breaks. Set cluster breaking threshold to 0 0.01 and you see not the clusters are breaking, but the shards inside the clusters. And to make thresholds affect clusters, we need to set the general threshold field with a lower value like 0 0.1, while the cluster breaking threshold can be set back to 1000. And now you can see the clusters are breaking. I don't understand why this both threshold fields will be swapped when using clusters. 
Scorpion81 told me it has to do with the kind of how the fracture modifier is programmed, but however, don't think too much about this, as we mostly will not change any of this values here. Great. As you now understand how constraints work with shards and clusters, there's one more thing I would like to show you. To bring our simulation to the next level, we can connect multiple fractured objects with constraints too. Yes, that's possible. Delete the falling cube and that breaking rules to 1 and 0 0.1. The thresholds back to their default values 10 and 1000 and make the cylinder visible again and make sure ghost is disabled. We can now duplicate the wall and place it on the top and don't forget to hit fracture and play the animation. The simulator does what we told to do. It simulates two broken walls that are placed on each other. But there's a way to connect them with constraints. And to do this, select both walls and open the automations panel on the left. And there's a button called connect. Click on it and play the animation. And look at this. It looks like the two balls are glued together. And what is this new box there? It's called FM Group Connector in the viewport, as it connects two objects that are in a specific group. We could say this means the box works now as a container for both walls and handles them like one object. And to make this one object breakable, it has a fracture modifier on it too. Of course, that means there's a new rigid body in our simulation and our add-on makes it automatically be a ghost object to not affect anything else. It's animated to not move anywhere and it's not a triggerer to avoid it uh, to trigger something. So you can place and scale the box wherever it's useful for you. I've decided to use this place and now we will look into how we can make changes. In the physics panel, have a look to the constraint settings. As everything there is set to zero, it would mean nothing should break. And actually, exactly this is happening. Both walls stay together. Remember, I'm talking about the connection from both walls when I say nothing breaks. I'm not talking about the walls itself. Yeah. So, what if you would like to break the connection? Should we use the general breaking setting or are cluster breaking settings the right to change? The answer is, you can use both, as there are so many other pieces and constraints in the scene, it will be complicated to control how exact this object connection will break. Just to try it once, set an angle of 0 0.1 and you can see that both walls will no longer stay together. Try an example, 0 0.75 and the wall's connection will break a bit later. But as the connection of these walls was what we originally were looking for, we could set this to zero and enjoy how great it is working. By the way, actually this will not work with triggering, but maybe in the future we will add support for this. Okay, so this is the end of the constraints tutorial. It might be a lot of information when looking at this the first time, but I'm sure you will understand constraints a lot better and you will laugh the way you can control your simulation now. Thank you for watching and let us see your new constraint simulation. You could add a link to the comments below. Goodbye.